Nobody wants to get united. Like, what we gotta do is meet everybody in home 49th Street at the bench. Hey, dudes, welcome back to the bench. Today, I got an interesting video for you guys because we're hopping back on the wall, this time with a bit of a value study. And I wanted to walk you guys not only through my thought process, but also why I'm doing this piece in general. So, in this piece, I wanted to go ahead and shade the graffiti to the point where I don't need lines. The science behind this is forms and value are compensators for line and vice versa. So, the more lines you have, the less you need values and forms. On the flip side, the more values you have in order to sculpt your forms, the less you need lines to do that. And in order to pull this off effectively, you not only need knowledge of the actual elements of art, but we also need knowledge of the art form specific fundamentals, such as letter structure. That way, our values and lack of lines don't destroy our letter structure. That is a really important hurdle. We began with a little bit of a sketch here. I wanted to make sure that the letter structure wasn't anything super crazy, but it also just wasn't a basic straight letter because I did want some technicalities in there that would allow me to go ahead and differentiate different parts of the letter structure based on value specifically. So the first order of business, before we do much of anything, we gotta drop that cast shadow in there. Now this is, after all, a cast shadow and not your typical drop shadow, which means we need to think about the three-dimensionality of our light source. Now it doesn't need to be 100% accurate, but it needs to convey the form in a convincing manner. And really all it has to do is suggest certain areas of the form. So once again, we're just gonna go ahead and block that in really nice and easy. And right at the very end of this cast shadow, we're gonna introduce a little bit of a lump there to kind of indicate the top portion of that G, that little chip that pops off. This is going to help make the cast shadow just a little bit more convincing. We blocked in the filling with some actual bucket paint here, and the reason we did this was for no other reason other than the fact that it was going to provide the opacity I wanted. I didn't want to have to keep going back over with spray paint to make sure that it looked like a solid filling. I just kind of felt like having a little bit of an underpainting in order to help that opacity. Now from here, we get into the 3D, and this is where we start off with the darker values. I enjoy starting off with the darker values. You don't by any means have to. It's just the way I like to work. So I start off with the darker values that coincide with the actual light source itself, which is coming from high up on the left hand side of the graffiti. And it's important that when we're considering our shading, we're really thinking about the direction the light is hitting these forms in. We don't really want to think about it in terms of, oh, I'm shading this letter, as much as we want to think about it as, I'm shading this form. This really helps us understand the way the light catches on to the letter itself. And that's really the only thing that's going to dictate how our light functions and where we're shading. So all the while, when we're shading, we're kind of angling the can away from the edges of the 3D and towards the fill-in of the 3D. As we shade these forms, I'm really careful to make sure that I have light areas hit dark areas in certain spots, and in other spots, I have completely lost edges. This is really important. You don't necessarily need to see every single angle of every single part of your piece. Sometimes losing some of the piece is good, as it helps direct the attention to a specific location that you might be more interested in. On the other hand, to build contrast, it can be really important to make sure that you have that kind of contrast between your lights and your darks. So in other words, making sure that certain light areas of your piece overlap or touch or come close to darker areas of your piece. You can actually see a great example of this on the chips later on in the piece where the 3D of the chip almost fades into the cast shadow from the actual G itself. And that same chip is right up against the shadow from the 3D on a different chip. Now that we got the shadows blocked in, we can go and throw in the mid-tone, we can go and throw in any other values that we might need, and then top it off with the highlights on top of all of those. I used a transparent can, I believe it was iron lac, in order to go ahead and block in the highlight areas. And I also used one of Flame Paint's brighter grays in order to block in the highlights. The issue here is I didn't have all that many different grays. So I had to be very careful what I put where because I wasn't working with the most values possible. Either way, I had enough in order to go ahead and make a convincing form. I decided to reserve the lightest values for the actual fill-in itself. This way, it'll help me differentiate letter structure from the 3D itself. It'll build a lot of contrast in that way and help it pop off the wall given the fact that it's such a brighter value than everything else there. So for the fill-in itself, we actually start off with a pretty, you know, bright fill-in, but on the bottom right, we actually go a little bit darker. It's a very slight difference, but it's enough in order to make that convincing form of sunlight coming down and losing energy as it kind of traverses down the actual front of the piece here. On top of that, we're really focusing on occlusion shadows. Essentially, occlusion shadows are going to be shadows that are not necessarily created from a directional light, but rather shadows that are created from light being trapped in a specific location. Go ahead and take a look around your room. If you're confused about how occlusion shadows work, look at where your wall meets the ceiling, or look where the two walls meet each other in the corner. You'll see a little tiny shadow in that area, in that crease. That is a great example of occlusion shadow. What happens is light comes in and it bounces between those two spots and it can't escape. This is what causes that shadow there. And that's all we're doing here. This is really helping us to layer different parts of the letter structure on top of one another in order to kind of create some details that otherwise wouldn't have been seen unless we used line work. Now for this piece, I pretty much used just one cap and that was it. I felt like it was working for what I needed it for. You know, had I been doing a more detailed image, you know, let's say I was doing subsurface scattering, which I might try next. If I was doing something that was a little bit more intensive, I certainly would have changed 
changed caps out, but I didn't really feel like I needed to with this piece. It was a pretty simplistic image overall. It's nothing too, too difficult if you understand how forms function. Another big challenge with this piece was the perspective. I tried to be as accurate as humanly possible, but I feel like because I don't specialize in spray paint, I didn't have enough can control in order to keep that accuracy 100% tight the way I would have liked it to. And this is something that you oftentimes see when people do one-point perspective in their graffiti. If you look at any one-point perspective on a wall, the majority of times the one-point perspective won't be 100% accurate for this reason. So this also serves as a bit of a can control practice, which is part of the reason why I wanted to share this video with you guys. That way anybody who's in my same position can kind of see how I practice these things as well. But I'm happy with the way it came out. <laughs> I'm happy with the perspective overall. Now that the majority of the shading is kind of blocked into this piece, we have one final step to do. One step that really sculpts form. This is really the secret to forms, other than occlusion shadows, because to be honest, occlusion shadows are a godsend. But reflective light. Reflective light is the unsung hero of well, shading in general. In all honesty, it helps to build a lot of depth. And we can actually show an example of this with this coaster right here. So let's say we have our light source. Light gets beamed out of there into the surrounding area. And when light comes in contact with the surface, it ricochets off that surface. Now, let's say if something was in the way of that ricochet, well then suddenly what you'd get is a reflective light. Light that hits the surface, bounces off, falls onto my face, and re-illuminates the shadow area. Just compare the difference, right? You have some shadow here. Notice how you have a little bit of a cooler color in there, and now it's a little bit of a warmer color because of my hand. But if we take that away and we replace it with this right here, suddenly it's a little bit brighter. Now the shadow is still dark, right? It's still the darker part. That's why it's a shadow. And what you gotta keep in mind, reflective light exists within the shadow itself. That means our reflective light still has to be darker than everything that's outside of the shadow. Our reflective light can't be brighter than things outside of the shadow. If that is the case, then it's not really reflective light. Instead, it's a secondary light source. So we have to add that to our graffiti. A little bit of reflective light here and there is gonna go a long way in order to help separate different forms in this piece. And it does it in such a slight, tiny way, but it makes such a huge difference. This is a great way in order to make your piece pop off the wall. And to be honest, it's not something I've seen pretty much any graffiti artist do in their more 2D graffiti. But I've definitely seen it in 3D graffiti artists work. People like Odith do this all the time. I think that's how you say his name. Maybe it's not how you pronounce it. Give it a try when you're shading your own graffiti, but remember, your reflective light has to still be darker than everything outside of the shadow. And with that, the piece is finished. Now, a couple of things I think I want to change up in the next iteration of this, I think I definitely want to go bigger. I feel like doing the piece bigger will just make life easier when shading compressed values. It'll also allow me to add more compressed values, which means I can sculpt forms even better. And on top of that, you know, let's kind of get into how you guys might be able to try this practice out as well for various different skill levels. Because I think shading your graffiti is really a great thing you can start adding into your work. So if you're brand new to graffiti or you're brand new to cans or maybe both of those things are true for you, then definitely start off with basic forms. You know, start off with your basic cube, your pyramid, your cone, as well as your sphere. Shade those things. This is really going to lay down the foundation that you need in order to shade any graffiti possible. From here, if you understand the elements of art and you understand the art form specific fundamentals, but you're still getting used to cans themselves, you're getting used to technique, then in this case, I would recommend just doing a basic straight letter. Whether it's one letter or a full name, that's up to you. Maybe you want to save paint and, you know, do one letter like I did here. Really doesn't matter. You're still going to get the same effects. Now, no matter your skill level in graffiti, if you do not understand the elements of art, then I highly recommend just sticking to basic forms. Cubes, spheres, so on and so forth. That way you can really understand that fundamental and how the formula behind it works. I think that's a great way to go about it. If you guys want to learn more about shading, if you guys want to learn a lot of in-depth information about this topic, I actually published a book about shading graffiti. So be sure to go ahead and check that out in the description down below. And check out the best how to do graffiti tutorials right up here with more graffiti content right down here. And I'll catch you guys back here next week. Thanks for watching.